it will be sad it will be glad to see you in kibitu события 2020 года пандемия самоизоляция локдауны да но не только они 2020 год это плюс 15 тысяч шибановцев новые лаборатории и кабинеты новые возможности smart university создан автономный образовательный портал системы прокторинга увеличено количество услуг smart арсу проведена неделя цифровизации достижения ученых учеными выиграны гранты на 160 миллионов тенге под руководством профессора Конышбека Шункеева разработан учебник по физике для школьников Казахстана. Открыт диссертационный совет на соискание степени PHD по филологии. Защищена диссертация по математике. Успехи студентов. Волонтерские организации и школа волонтеров стали лучшими проектами области. Проведен международный студенческий семинар «Перспективы развития студенческого самоуправления в эпоху цифровизации». Участники стартап Академии выиграли гранты на свои проекты почти на 3 миллиона тенге. Международное признание. Университет стал соорганизатором международной конференции QS. Жбанов Университет впервые вошел в международный рейтинг QS University Ratings и ECA и занял 351 место среди лучших вузов. Год Абая. Имя и наследие Абая стало ближе тысячам казахстанцев. Проведено множество мероприятий и конкурсов. Опубликовано несколько научных трудов. Книга о Байтану передана во все школьные библиотеки области. И, конечно же, 2020 – это юбилейный год университета Жубанова. Проведено 85 благотворительных мероприятий. 503 человека награждены юбилейными медалями. 85 педагогов получили премии от областной профсоюзной организации работников образования и науки. Выпускники Активинской области стали обладателями 85 грантов имени Кудабергена Шубанова. Зарегистрировано 85 патентов. Учеными факультетами передано в библиотеку по 85 книг. Студентами реализовано 85 старта проектов. В 2020 году Жубанов Университет перелистнул 85-ю страницу своей истории, чтобы с новыми целями идти вперед вместе с вами. Students and colleagues, my name is Aaron Chikanover, and I am an Israeli physician and biologist working at the Faculty of Medicine of the Technion, which is Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. I happen also to be a laureate of the 2004 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering the ubiquitin-mediated proteolytic system. I intend to participate and to give a talk at the Central Asia Nobel Festival series of lectures, and I invite you all to participate, to inspire us, and to be inspired. But mostly, I want you to learn from this participation one lesson. People like us, who made the important discoveries, are human beings exactly like you are. We have two hands, two eyes, two legs, we are simple human beings, and if we could do it, you can do it as well. So all the best, and hope to meet you all in the upcoming uh, festival of Nobel laureates in Kazakhstan. Take good care of yourself and stay safe. Welcome to the Central Asia Nobel Fest in 2021. This is John Mather, Senior Project Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope working at NASA in Greenbelt, Maryland, the United States. I'm interested in the whole history of the universe from the Big Bang to now, how life became possible on our own little planet circling an ordinary star, how we can protect our planet and how far we can go. 
I hope you will find the Nobel Fest a fascinating adventure. Hi, I'm David Spurgo. I won the Breakthrough Prize in 2018, and I'm excited about speaking at the Central Asia Nobel Fest on my work and others on cosmology. Uh, over the past 20 years, we've learned, up, learned that atoms, the stuff that makes up us, makes up only 5% of the universe. So I'll be telling the story of how we probe the dark matter, the dark energy, and look back to the beginnings of the universe and uh, learn how structure and galaxies and everything else emerges. Look forward to seeing you soon. Hello, I'm Christopher Haken, 2018 Breakthrough Prize winner. I'm very excited about the upcoming Central Asia Nobel Fest lecture series. I hope you'll join us. I am working as Center of Chemical Engineer at KB2 since 2015. It is a great pleasure to welcome to our center. A study at our center provides students new knowledge, new technology. Uh, our Center of Chemical Engineer has trained more than 500 uh, chemical technologists. Our degrees lead into this uh, to successful lives and careers as uh, scientists specialist and scholars. Our bachelor program is the best in Kazakhstan by independent Kazakhstan agency. We have international accreditation. Our programs licensed by international agency. Uh, I can say that KB2 is the number one in Kazakhstan. It will be sad. It will be glad to see you in KB2. Событиям 2020 года. Пандемия. Самоизоляция. Локдауны. Да, но не только они. 2020 год — это плюс 15 тысяч шибановцев. Новые лаборатории и кабинеты. Новые возможности Smart University. Создан автономный образовательный портал собственной системой прокторинга. Увеличено количество услуг Smart Arsu. Проведена неделя цифровизации. Достижения ученых. Учеными выиграны гранты на 160 миллионов тенге. Под руководством профессора Конышбека Шумкеева разработан учебник по физике для школьников Казахстана. Открыт диссертационный совет на соискание степени PHD по филологии. Защищена диссертация по математике. Успехи студентов. Волонтерские организации и школа волонтеров стали лучшими проектами области. Проведен международный студенческий семинар «Перспективы развития студенческого самоуправления в эпоху цифровизации». Участники стартап Академии выиграли гранты на свои проекты почти на 3 миллиона тенге. Международное признание. Университет стал соорганизатором международной конференции QS. Жбанов Университет впервые вошел в международный рейтинг QS University Ratings и ECA и занял 351 место среди лучших вузов. Год Абая. Имя и наследие Абая стало ближе тысячам казахстанцев. Проведено множество мероприятий и конкурсов. Опубликовано несколько научных трудов. Книга Абайтану передана во все школьные библиотеки области. И, конечно же, 2020 – это юбилейный год университета Жубанова. Проведено 85 благотворительных мероприятий. 503 человека награждены юбилейными медалями. 85 педагогов получили премии от областной профсоюзной организации работников образования и науки. Выпускники Активинской области стали обладателями 85 грантов имени Кудобергена Жубанова. Зарегистрировано 85 патентов. Учеными и факультетами передано в библиотеку по 85 книг. Студентами реализовано 85 стартап-проектов. В 2020 году Жубанов Университет перелистнул 85-ю страницу своей истории, чтобы с новыми целями идти вперед вместе с вами.
Hello everyone, my name is Viktor Bruce. I'm assistant professor at the Department of Physics of Nazarbayev University. And I'm glad to introduce our today's uh, speaker uh, in the scope of the Central Asia Nobel Fest lecture series, a prominent uh, Swiss scientist, the Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry 2002, Dr. Kurt Wüttry. Currently, he is a professor of biophysics at a number of prestigious institutions worldwide, ETH Zurich, the Scripps Research Institute in California, and iHuman Institute of Shanghai Tech University. Dr. Wirtrich has made a pioneering contribution to the development of nuclear uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy of determining three-dimensional structure of biological macromolecules uh, in solutions, means under the most natural conditions that is really important for the development of this uh, field of research. Today, Dr. Wittrich kindly prepared a lecture uh, in the scope of our lecture series on historical highlights of the development of X-ray crystallography and structural biology. So let us enjoy it together. I welcome you to the lecture course on X-ray crystallography and cryo-electron microscopy in structural biology. My own work is only in a very limited way related to crystallography and electron microscopy. In my research, I am using nuclear magnetic resonance as a complementary method to the two techniques that are the subject of this talk. I will, therefore, in this introductory lecture, not only provide an overview of the historical development of structural biology with the use of crystallography and electron microscopy, but I will also, towards the end, give you some ideas on where the complementarity of these methods is with the NMR method, about which we present a different course during this same semester. On this first slide, you get an indication of the very first contributions to X-ray crystallography, long before this technique was used for studies of proteins. Röntgen in 1885 was the first to produce X-rays, and there is a famous picture of his using the X-ray beam on the hand of his wife, showing very clearly her bones and the position of the wedding ring on her ring finger. In 1912, two groups observed X-ray diffraction in crystals. On the one hand, this was a group of the Bragg family in England and then also in von Laue's laboratory in Germany. And in the next year, 1913, the Braggs actually studied the structure of diamond with crystallography. And the two Braggs, father and son, are the only father and son team that was awarded a prize in the history of the Nobel Prizes. 
ein Röntgen, was der very first laureate in physics in 1901. So that gives you an impression of how important X-ray crystallography has been during much more than the last century. Why should we be interested to use these techniques who have long been developed with inorganic materials? Why should we use those for biological macromolecules? I want to illustrate this by reminding you of the wide range of functions that are performed by different proteins in our bodies. That includes protection by skin and by hair. That includes catalysis by enzymes, regulation of metabolic processes by hormones, transport of essential goods inside the body, such as oxygen or electrons. And when we then look at the chemical structure of proteins, then we cannot find a variety that would readily fit in with a large breadth of different functions. Because in the chemistry, proteins are linear chains containing 20 different amino acid residues, which are inserted into these chains in repetition, because typically a protein contains many more than 20 different amino acids. And of course, it is the order in which the amino acids are built into these chains that determine the structure. But unless we learn about the three-dimensional arrangement of these uh, chains, we cannot readily rationalize how the different functions come about. I want to illustrate this to you with a specific project aimed at drug development. For long time, drug development was based on trial and error methods that usually started with physiological effects from natural compounds. And here, now, with the advent of structure determination of both the molecules that are used as drugs and the parts of the body that function as the receptors for these drug molecules, we can now think about rational design of new drugs or improvements of existing drugs. Now the drug cyclosporin A was introduced in the 1980s to suppress immune rejection of foreign tissue. And it is of historical importance in the history of human medicine because it opened the doors for the use of organ transplantation in human medicine. Cyclophilin is the primary receptor to which the drug molecules bind, and the two form a complexes of one protein molecule of cyclophilin with one molecule of the drug cyclosporin A. And the structure was solved in 1990 by combined use of 
X-ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy. The structure shows that shows the receptor protein in light blue and the drug molecule in functional colors. From such a structure determination, we derive at least one important piece of information with regard to drug development. Here in this particular system, there were two key observations that were made. The first is that the binding site for the drug on the receptor molecule was identified. And from knowledge of the binding site, it is then possible for medicinal chemists to examine the structure of the drug molecule. You see, it is in itself a small protein-like compound. It is a cyclic peptide with 11 mostly unusual amino acids. That is unusual. They are non-proteinogenic amino acids. And now the chemists can start thinking in a rational way by comparing the structure with the binding site on the receptor on how they might possibly modify the chemical structure so as to achieve a better fit of the molecule into the binding site and as a follow-up possibly enable the reduction of the dosage of the drug and therefore the potential side effects that are usually associated with the introduction of any new drug. And so we can then put the drug back into its binding site after having tried to improve its functional properties and test whether this attempt was successful. Now I told you there is a second line of information that we obtained in this particular system. I welcome you to the lecture course on weight and based on these uh, patterns. So there was a first classification of structural proteins. After limited to allow for a reduction of the dosage of the drug and therefore the potential side effects that are usually associated with the introduction of any new drug. And so we can then put the drug back into its binding site after having tried to improve its functional properties and test whether this attempt was successful. Now, information that we obtained in this particular system, which is that the drug molecule assumed a completely, really completely different three-dimensional structure when bound to the receptor than when it was examined in isolated form. And this, of course, was a second very important piece of basic information in the continued development of drugs for immune suppression in transplantation medicine. Having hopefully convinced you that knowing three-dimensional structures of proteins is important for our understanding of their functions, let me now continue with a story on the, with the story on the development of structural biology over the years. In 1920, fiber diagrams of silk, hair, muscle, 
and tendons were recorded. This is a relatively straightforward experimental design. Say you take a hair, you arrange the hair so that an X-ray beam can be sent through the hair and you observe diffraction patterns. Usually the diffraction patterns were so few that they were far too limited to allow for uh, structure determination. They could just indicate are two different fibers of the same type or do they have different intrinsic structure. Then in 24, the structure of graphite, that's an inorganic compound, was determined. And in 1933, Ruska built the first functioning electron microscope. Now you have seen that when I talked about fire diagrams, I mentioned the names of Herzog and of Asbury. And Asbury was particularly active. He was a leading figure in the field at that time. And one also notices that this early work on structural biology with proteins was mainly concentrated in Australia and New Zealand for the simple reason that there was a lot of interest in characterizing the physico-chemical properties of wool. And in 1935, Asbury and his colleagues had classified structural proteins in multiple groups, the KMEF groups. This is carotene, myosin, epidermin, and fibrinogen. And these four types of structural proteins were complemented by collagen, which was recognized as being different. Now, in the experiments that were performed with these fibers, different to different extents, pull was exercised on the fiber. And there are fibers that can be pulled two to three times the original length, and then change the diffraction pattern, and others did not react to mechanical forces that would try to increase the length. And so in 1935, Asbury wrote a poem in an article that he published on these proteins, and he said the amino acid in chains are the cause, so the X-ray explains, of the stretching of wool and its strengths when you pull and show why it shrinks when it drains. You see, this is all very strictly focused on wool and the wool industry. But it is important to emphasize that Asbury and his colleagues had no idea on what KMEF structures were or what collagen structures were. It was a completely empirical start into the field with having patterns of a few diffractions on a, on a photographic plate and based on these uh, patterns. So there was a first classification of structural proteins. After, mostly after the war, but also during the first years of the war, the development from this empirical classification 
of structural proteins toward today's atomic resolution, structural biology was achieved. The first mention on this slide refers to a painstaking study by the group of Linus Pauling of amino acids and dipeptides by X-ray crystallography. The important result from these studies was that exact dimensions could be obtained for the amino acids, for the peptide bones, and for, uh, and for the side chains of the amino acids. And I will come in a minute to why this was so important. Outside, directly of the field of structural biology, it was discovered in 1944 that the genetic material is DNA rather than proteins, as had been believed. And in 1946, the genetics of bacteria and viruses was introduced by groups in the United States. The impact of these two pro progresses in biological research can ha hardly be overestimated. To know that it is a DNA, that is a genetic material, is of course absolutely crucial. It was so unexpected that it took until 1952, until another group of scientists could confirm the result of Avery that it is a DNA, not proteins, that represents the genetic material. Unfortunately, Avery died several years before 1952, and therefore he does not have a star. He was not recognized by a Nobel Prize for his uh, huge step forward in biological research. As far as the 1946 achievement goes, you have to see that whereas Mendel could study at most three generations of his peas in his genetic studies, working with bacteria and in particular with viruses enables to study dozens of generations in days or weeks. And that has completely revolutionized the field of genetics. And of course, in structural biology, we are on a daily basis using bacteria to produce the proteins that we want to study with our methods. Now, in the first four years of the 1950s, we see three real breakthroughs in structural biology. Polling using the exact dimensions of the natural amino acids and of dipeptides built models of secondary structures, the alpha helix and the beta sheets. And it is remarkable how precise these early models were obtained based on a minimal set of X-ray diffractions from fibers that were previously this uh, 
previously described as KMEF, it was now found out that some of these contain alpha helices, others contain beta sheets. In a similar way, Crick and Watson determined the DNA double helix, again based on the information on the exact dimensions of the building stones of DNA and on a very limited set of X-ray fiber diffraction data collected by uh, Rosalind Franklin in the Institute of Wilkins, also in England. And I do want to mention that Professor Siegner from the University of Bern, with whom I was studying organic chemistry long ago, he was the person who provided the DNA that enabled uh, Rosalind Franklin to measure the data that were an important part for the development of the double helical model by Crick and Watson. And in 1954, the Indian scientist Ramachandran proposed a model for the collagen triple helix. Again, this was based on careful use of the precise data on the dimensions of amino acids and short peptides that had been collected by polling. I want to remind you of how these different results looked in pictures. You see here an alpha helix, an alpha helix with all side chains attached, which gives a re realistic feeling for the stiffness of an actual alpha helix with a typical distribution of amino acid side chains. You have here an anti-parallel beta sheet. You can see that the hydrogen bones across the beta sheet are almost parallel throughout the length of the sheet structure. Then we have parallel beta sheets which where the hydrogen bones are cued relative to each other. These uh, secondary structures were presented by polling in publications in 1951, 1952, and 20 years later, almost 20 years later, it was recognized that these secondary structures are indeed the most common elements found in three-dimensional structures of globular proteins. Here you have a picture of the DNA double helix with uh, base pairs inside and the backbone outside. Let me just indicate that this model of DNA presented the biologists with lots of problems because it was not at all obvious how information could be read off such a structure. And it took actually quite a lot of years, almost a decade, until uh, the structure of the DNA was widely used for work in biological research laboratories. And here you see a picture of the triple helix of collagen that was proposed by Ramachandran and later on also shown to be the correct structure by X-ray crystallography of uh, crystalline samples of collagen. 
these early steps to with atomic resolution structure determination was continued during the 50s and culminated on the one hand in the determination of the first amino acid sequence of a protein by Fred Sanger. He determined the amino acid sequence of insulin and a few years later in the same institute in the MRC in Cambridge the first protein crystal structures were determined myoglobin and hemoglobin and in between Ramachandran in India made an extremely important contribution in the form of the Ramachandran plot which again and I like to emphasize this which again is based on the data obtained by Pauling's group studying amino acids and dipeptides and getting the exact dimensions of these building blocks of polypeptide chains. I'm going to show to you some illustrations of first the what the amino acid sequence is that should not be any news for you we have amino acids we have condensation of two amino acids into a dipeptide and then we extend the length by continuous condensations with additional amino acids and the important result now regarding the Ramachandran plot was that Pauling in his studies of dipeptides showed that the peptide bones are planar. are planar and they have rotational freedom only about the single bones with which the peptide units are linked to the alpha carbon of the central amino acid residue. So you have in principle rotational freedom of two planes about two axes indicated in this picture by phi and psi. In principle, that spans a plane of 360 by 360 degrees. However, Ramachandran discovered, again simply by model building, that when he performed the rotations about these torsion angles phi and psi, that a large part of conformation space that is a large part of the phi psi combinations are sterically impossible and this is presented in what is referred to as the Ramachandran plot you see on the vertical axis the angle psi changing from plus 180 to minus 180 and on the horizontal axis, the angle phi changing over the same range. Depending on the amino acid side chains, only a limited part of all possible phi psi combinations are possible because of sterical clashes. So there is just one amino acid glycine which does not have a stereo center at C alpha and therefore you see this dotted areas which are symmetrically distributed over the phi psi plane but even for glycine the presence of the hydrogen 
atoms introduces clashes that prevent the population of more than half of the total uh, allowed of the total space that is spanned by phi and psi. When we go to particularly large amino acid side chains, isoleucine and valine, which have uh, branching side chains already at uh, beta carbon, then the allowed range of conformations is reduced to about 8% of the whole phi psi plane. And these insights are used today and you don't even rationalize it, you get a structure refinement program and the basic approach in this structure refinement program is to use uh, Ramachandran plots to check for forbidden pieces in the structure that was experimentally determined. I want to continue illustrating what the state of the field was at the end of the 1950s by showing you the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin that were at the time presented. You see here Max Perutz, who is by all considered to have been the father of protein crystallography, holding a polypeptide chain that represents the beta subunit of hemoglobin. And here you see the structure of hemoglobin as it was presented up to about 1965. You see not atoms here, but you see small pieces of laminated wood that had been cut out to fit the electron density maps, and you can roughly follow how individual helices run in this structure and you can see the positions of the heme groups where the oxygen atoms uh, the oxygen molecules are reversibly bound when hemoglobin takes up oxygen in the lungs and gives it up to myoglobin in the muscles. In order to communicate with a wider range of scientists simplified pictures of the molecules were soon introduced in particular by the Scientific American and you see here a drawing showing the fold of myoglobin that appeared in 1963. And you see the end terminus of the chain in the lower left. The C terminus is in the upper left. And you see how seven helices are formed that wrap around the heme group, which is shown in yellow. And here you see a photograph of the Nobel laureates of 1962 receiving a Nobel Prize for structure determination of hemoglobin and myoglobin by Max Perut, the second from the left, and John Kendrew on the extreme right, and for the proposal of the double helix model of DNA by Wilson, Crick, and Watson really made structural biology a discipline that is widely 
recognized. And of course, the scientist pose here together with the literature laureate with the name of Steinbeck. During the 1960s, biology made big developments. And I can perhaps best illustrate this with the following story. I studied at the University of Bern from 1957 to 1962. I never followed the biology course. In 1965, I picked up a book on the molecular biology of the cell by Jim Watson and some collaborators. And after reading this book, I was familiar with the modern biology that had evolved during the first five years of the 1960s. And from there on, I was teaching biology in, uh, at CTH in particular. And it would only have been a disadvantage for me to have learned the biology of the 1950s. It would certainly have blocked easy access to modern biology by reading the book by Watson and this group. So what does this new biology include? It includes the discovery of allosteri in gene regulation, specifically in the lac operon by a group at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Then Anne Vinson, during a visit at NIH, proposed his famous principle supported by experiments that a given amino acid sequence determines the three-dimensional structure of the protein. This finding has been very fruitful over the years, but it has not held up until today because we know now many instances where a given polypeptide sequence can give rise to different structures, many of which are related to diseases. So we actually talk about protein misfolding diseases today. In 1962, Arbor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland with uh, his colleagues Nathan and Smith discovered restriction enzymes. Why this was at the time a protection mechanism of bacteria against invasion by viruses Restriction enzymes have become the basis of protein engineering and we use, I mean we meaning structural biologists, using, use the principle of restriction enzymes in practice on a daily basis when producing proteins for structural studies. In 65, uh, first sequence of uh, RNA, the transfer RNA, uh, transfer RNA from yeast was determined and around the same time the genetic code, that is the code 
by which the sequence of the DNA is translated into the amino acid sequence of a protein has been determined. That was the culmination of many years of heated discussion among scientists in England, France, and the United States. And in the end, the work was performed on the one hand by a chemist, Corona, on the other hand by a biologist, Nirenberg, which led to the effective determination of the code. And in 1968, a an an three-dimensional electron microscopy model was determined of bacteriophage T4, which was the first such comprehensive low-resolution structure and in this way also represents new biology of the 1960s. And the 1960s for structural biology were very nicely summarized in a book by Dickerson, who is a crystallographer, and Geis, who is an artist. And the title of the book is The Structure and Action of Proteins. It's a small book. It is easy to read. It is readily available from uh, various sources in paperback editions. And what it meant is that in this book, for the first time, the protein structures were presented in simplified pictures that made them accessible to a wide community of researchers in biology and the biomedical sciences. And they include in the book all the structures that had been solved during the first decade. These are myoglobin, hemoglobin, cytochrome C, lysozyme ribonuclease A, ribonuclease S, papain, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase A. The reason why there are only few structures solved within more than 10 years after the first success is that given the absence of powerful computers, a structure determination by X-ray crystallography was a very big amount of work. Typically, groups of 10 to 20 scientists would work for many years to determine a structure. This compares to doing it in half a day today. It's uh, quite amazing. Now, what are these proteins? Myoglobin and hemoglobin uh, transport and store oxygen. Cytochrome C transfers electrons, and the other six proteins are all enzymes, where lysozyme was the first enzyme structure to be solved and has given insights into quite general rules about enzymatic activity. I show you here the cover of the book by Dickerson and Geis. This is an artistic drawing by Erwin Geis of the structure of hemoglobin. Geis has produced hundreds of drawings of biological macromolecules, and these are collected in a museum in Manhattan. There are more than 300 exhibits in this uh, museum. 
Now, I take 1968-69 as the years where my work with NMR started. And I just want to give you a little insight into what happened. See, so 10 proteins of which the crystal structures were solved by 1969 are those which are readily obtainable from natural sources. To just put it bluntly, you can take half a liter of blood from a horse or from a human being and you can produce two grams of purified hemoglobin. And that's what was needed in order to have a chance at structure determination by X-ray crystallography at the time. And, but the resolution of the crystal structures was very limited and so there was a chance to complement crystal structures with information from other techniques. And here I'm introducing an experiment that I did in 1968. You see here a line drawing of the structure of myoglobin, again drawn by hand by Irwin Geis, the peer in the Scientific American. I added some coloring in red, the heme group of myoglobin, in yellow, a valin side chain near the heme, in red and white, a phenylalanin side chain also located near the heme, and on the right, an arginine side chain that forms a salt bridge with one of the propionic acid side chains of the heme. And when I isolated hemoglobin from my own blood and ran NMR spectra, we had a huge surprise in that we found lines far away from where they were expected to be. You expect to have lines only in what is shown in the upper trace on this image, which shows its age very convincingly, I think. And you see in the lower traces lines that extend very far out to the left and quite far out to the right. And having seen these lines made it possible to complement the insights from crystallography by showing that there were changes near the heme within the subunits of hemoglobin that were associated with the binding of release and release of oxygen. And this information was at the time not seen from the crystal structures. A even clearer result was obtained with cytochrome C. The structure of cytochrome C was determined by Richard Dickerson, one of the authors of this 1969 book. And here is the presentation of the raw data. Again, by wooden uh, laminated pieces of wood, which were cut out to fit the electronic electron density map and then paste it together to outline the ways that the polypeptide chain winds in space. And in black color, you have the location of the heme group. In the work of Erwin Geis, this structure became, got this appearance which is a quite a beautiful piece of applied art. And in here, 
when you now concentrate on the big white ball in the very center, in the center also of the reddish hymn group, you can see that to the right it is bound, as we say, coordinated to a histidine side chain, and on the left there is no ligand bound. And when we run NMR spectra of cytochrome C, and that goes back all the way to 1968, 69, then the identity of that six ligand was immediately apparent by the lines that one sees here on the extreme right in the spectrum. And there were supplementary experiments that uh, very directly proved that this is the ligand on the six coordination site. So NMR already at that time could provide structural information that escaped X-ray crystallography with the then available resolution. And for me personally, it convinced me that we would eventually be able to determine complete protein structures using this technology. And I will, in a few minutes, give you some in indications of why this was not trivial and what it meant to and means today to determine structures in solution rather than in crystals or in frozen layers for cryo-electron microscopy. The 1970s are characterized by the introduction of new technology for structural biology. Genetic engineering, of course, changed the access of structural biologists to a vast range of different proteins that could not readily be obtained directly from the natural sources. In 74, independently, Aaron Klug and Alex Rich determined a crystal structure of a transfer RNA, that's the same RNA of which the sequence was determined in 1965. Around 1975, the first synchrotron beam lines for protein crystallography were built. In 1975, also a low resolution electron microscopy structure of bacterial rhodopsin was published by Henderson and Unwin, and this early EM structure already showed the seven transmembrane helix architecture of GPCRs. And in 1976, Frank published the image processing software for electron microscopy, which runs under the name of SPIDER, and which was one of the elements that resulted in the breakthrough of cryo-EM that I will come to in a few minutes. Here you see as an illustration the gold-plated model of the tRNA molecule determined by the group of Alex Rich. These technical advances were followed by what I would refer to as really new paradigms for biological research. These include the sequencing of DNA. And you see that Sanger now has two stars because he's the only scientist who got two chemistry Nobel Prizes, the first 
for the sequence determination of polypeptide chains and now for the sequencing of DNA. In 1978, Sharp and Roberts discovered the splicing of messenger RNA in eukaryotes. In 1980, we finally got high-resolution crystal structures of DNA, and it was not just one double helical structure as it was proposed in 1953 based on scarce data, but it was shown that there are at least three major forms of DNA. We'll see those in a minute. In 1981, the scanning tunneling microscope was developed here in Zurich. It was around the same time when we determined the NMR method, and we would have regular seminars in each other's uh, laboratory around 1980 to discuss, discuss the progress that we were making with our methods. And in 1982, it was found that enzymatic activity is not only a property of proteins, but a very important property of RNAs. Of course, these developments, the sequencing of DNA, the splicing of messenger RNA, and the discovery of enzymatic activity in RNAs changed the world of biology for the next decades. Here you have a visualization of the atomic resolution structures of DNA. You have ADNA, BDNA, and ZDNA. The reason why it took so long to get real structure determinations of DNA is that no material was available to determine either X-ray structures or NMR structures. It was only towards the end of the 1970s that chemists were able to synthesize short pieces of DNA in sufficient quantity to grow crystals and determine the three-dimensional structure. The variation among the three different double helical structures is achieved by changing the degree of solvation of the double helix and in the case of ZDNA to changing the concentration of salts in the solution used for obtaining the single crystals. We then again have a period with extensive introduction of new technology. In 1983, new technology was introduced to obtain a high-resolution structure of a large membrane protein, the photosynthetic reaction center, Around 1984, vitrification of electron microscopy samples was introduced. There is a Swiss scientist, Dubochet, who got the Nobel Prize for his contributions to the sample preparation for electron microscopy. In 1985, we published the first NMR structure of a globular protein in solution. And at the same time, when and Tanaka in Japan developed methods 
that enable mass spectrometry of intact proteins. Uh, Fen, Tanaka and I actually shared the Chemistry Nobel Prize in 2002. So you see, it took roughly 20 years for the Swedes to realize how important these techn techniques were for the future of protein research. And then in 1986, the polymerase chain reaction was introduced by Mollis and as all in biological research in the lab know, PCR again has changed the ways of daily life of students and senior scientists alike. Without PCR, very little would be done today in our laboratories. For illustration, I show you a picture of the first protein of which the structure was determined by NMR in solution. During the last decade of the 20th century, important initiatives set the stage for the following century. There was a first glimpse at a, what is referred to high resolution electron microscopy structure of Baxter rhodopsin in 1990. In 1991, the third generation synchrotron beamlines for protein crystallography was, were introduced and in 2000, the DNA sequence of the human genome was presented in a global form. That means it, there was a lot of room left for refinements in the following years, but this, of course, was a tremendous milestone, which also affects today the ways in which structural biology is pursued. And with regard to structural biology in the 21st century, it was a very big event that sizable amounts of money were offered in the United States, in Japan, and to a lesser extent in Europe for the so-called protein structure initiatives which pursued high throughput structural genomics studies which had a great impact on the further improvement of all aspects of the technology of X-ray crystallography with proteins as well as NMR structure determination of proteins. I want to illustrate to you how fast the field of structural biology evolved since 1990. At the beginning of 1990, there were less than 200 different structures on record. And in 1990, Wayne Hendrickson and I decided to publish a yearly compendium of newly published three-dimensional structures of proteins and nucleic acids. And we started this book by including a two-page summary of the newly determined structures. You see here the cover of the 1992 edition. Now, when we started this venture in 1990, we had to deal with little, le little more than 100 structures per year. By the mid-1990s, 
we approached 500, and by the late 1990s, 1,000 structure determinations per year. Of course, at that stage, we had to give up this uh, publication of a hardcover book, and the data handling has now been completely taken over by the Protein Data Bank. I show you this structure determined in our institute by the group of Professor Richmond of the nucleosome core of chromatin structure. And I think it's a nice introduction to what is happening in the 21st century where more and more such complex structures are determined by high resolution. I have summarized this here in this text. I only want to point out the incredible revolution of the field of structural biology by the introduction of techniques that make cryo-electron microscopy a viable technique uh, for atomic resolution, structure determination. And I also want to point out to the fact that by now we have more than 170,000 structures in the PDB, and these numbers are still growing rapidly. So, in summary, biomacromolecular three-dimensional structures have been determined since 1957 by X-ray crystallography, since 1984 by NMR in solution, and since about 2012, but more realistically, actually, since about 2016, we have a ever-increasing number of new structures determined by cryo-electron microscopy. Since this is my field, and you will not hear more about this in the course of these lectures, I may mention that we offer a separate course on structural biology by NMR spectroscopy also in this semester. I will now give you a brief overview of what is special about solving structures of proteins in solution rather than in crystals or in frozen layers for cryo-electron microscopy. So this is your crash course in NMR in structural biology. The, the father of crystallography, Max Perutz, quoted in a book that he published in 1997 that uh, his mentor, as when he was a PhD student, said, this is Dr. Bernal, said in 1936, the secret of life lies in the structure of proteins, and there is only one way of solving it, and that is by X-ray crystallography. Now, uh, this, of course, is sort of intriguing, and as you see, we now have three methods that independently can solve the problem. And in our case, we were aiming at getting three-dimensional protein structures by NMR in solution. NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, why is this special? 
in the first place, it is special because in solution, the molecules are not held fixed in space, but they are under the regime of Brownian motion. Robert Brown has described the motion of particles suspended in liquids that now carries his name. What he observed was that when pieces of plants, he was a botanist, when pieces of plants fell into a water beaker, they wouldn't stand still, but when he looked at these particles under the microscope, he discovered that they underwent translational motions in the liquid. And large particles would change direction less frequently than smaller particles. He published this data, and 70 years later, Albert Einstein made sense of it and developed the theory that we can now use to rationalize the effects of Brownian motion in NMR spectra. This is just uh, for fun. It seems remarkable to me that when Albert Einstein presented a lecture in Bern in 1907, there were exactly 20 people in the audience. And he talked about the nature of motions of microscopically small parts which are suspended in liquids. In other words, about his theory of the Brownian motion. So Einstein himself gave lectures almost exclusively about the Brownian motion during the years after 1905. Not so much about the special relativity theory. And for reference, this uh, the work on the Brownian motion is published in German in the Annalen der Physik in 1905 and 1906. And what he describes here is exactly what we are dealing with when talking about solution NMR of macromolecules. The Brownian motion occurs at frequencies of about 10 to 10 per second. And because these are stochastic motions, it is at the first glance not possible to get a sharp picture. As you know, it is difficult to get a sharp photograph of any moving object unless it moves periodically so that you can average uh, uh, multiple shots and get a clear picture. So the problem here is that we have stochastic motions at such high, resol at such high frequency that there is no shutter that would satisfy the demands of getting a direct picture of an object moving under this regime. However, there are scalar quantities that are, of course, not sensitive either to translational or rotational motions and which, as it was shown subsequently, do indeed determine the three-dimensional structure of objects such as proteins. I illustrate here what the key to it all is. The distance between two atoms here, between two hydrogen atoms, is a scalar property which is invariant under rotation. That means the distance is the same in the unit at the 
very uh, top on the left and the very top in the right at the bottom. So it is invariant under rotation and it's also the same distance on the left and the right of the screen. And if we can measure a sufficient number of such distances, find a method that translates such distance measurements into a three-dimensional structure in Cartesian space, then we can solve the problem. And uh, that way, a structure determination was first performed in 1984 and in principle is still performed uh, these days. So you prepare a solution, you don't need crystals, you run multidimensional NMR spectra, such as COSI, NOSI, SEXI and FOXI. These are acronyms for the first set of experiments that we used. And here you have an illustration of how a two-dimensional NMR experiment looks. You have a two-dimensional frequency space which replaces the traditional, by then still traditional, one-dimensional arrangement of the resonance lines on a single frequency axis. It doesn't help to be able to measure distances even with two-dimensional NMR if you cannot assign the distances to discrete locations in a linear chain molecule as we find it in proteins. And this is illustrated here with an early experimental spectrum where you have again the two-dimensional frequency plane and you have an intense diagonal which represents the resonance positions that it would be in the one-dimensional spectrum. As soon as we can assign a particular peak, each peak represents a distance of less than five angstroms between two hydrogen atoms, as soon as we can assign such a peak to particular sites on the linear polypeptide chain, it enforces the formation of a loop, as is shown at the top on the right. Since a typical spectrum here contains hundreds of lines, we are faced with the situation that the experimental data impose hundreds or more recently even thousands of closed loops at the same time in the polypeptide chain. And if we find, using the principle of distance geometry for the structure determination, and we get from distances to structure with distance geometry, and the important thing to notice here is that the distance space that provides us with the information for a high resolution three-dimensional structure typically has a dimension of one to several thousand. The reason for this is that each measured distance constraint leads to a sizable number of repulsive constraints. It's a little bit similar to the considerations that led to the Ramachandran plot. And so when we measure, when we close one cycle, as I had shown, we usually have clashes of half a dozen pairs of atoms, which also add to this, uh, to this mass of distance constraints 
And once you are able to handle this problem, you get an atomic resolution structure of the protein under study. I want to end by just giving you a glimpse of the special relations between the ETH Zürich and NMR spectroscopy. It is so that a student of the ETH, Felix Bloch, and two professors at CTH, Richard Ernst and myself, obtained Nobel Prizes in the field of NMR spectroscopy that represents the majority of Nobel Prizes and exactly half of the names behind these four, the four Nobel Prizes for NMR. Felix Bloch, after his studies, moved to the United States and he invented NMR spectroscopy in 1946 and he got a physics Nobel Prize in 1952. Richard Ernst was a professor in physical chemistry at the ETH Zürich and he got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for the introduction of Fourier transform techniques into NMR spectroscopy and for using this technology to obtain multidimensional NMR spectra. And I got the prize for having solved a protein structure by NMR in solution. You see here our pictures at the time when we performed this work and when we were for a time housed in wooden shacks on top of the building at the Universitätsstraße, which is on the lower left in this picture, clarified here. And so starting assistant professors in these shacks was not a bad method of the ETH to get us started after our returns from work in the United States. With this, I have come to the end of what I wanted to tell you today. I am well aware that these are mostly stories that are not quantitative and not technical. This will now change in the next lectures of this semester where you will hear about details of the use of X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM, not just what these techniques can do, but how it is done. And I finish the lecture with this picture of the first protein structure, a new picture, a surface view of the first uh, structure that was solved by NMR. And what I want to point out especially is that the colors indicate motions, mobility, rate processes in these proteins, as well as interaction sites with reaction partners. And when you now hear about crystallography and cryo-EM, I want to put into the back of your mind that there is NMR spectroscopy that can provide additional information to the three-dimensional molecular architectures determined by these methods in showing the biological macromolecules as living entities full of dynamics and potentialities to interact with other parts of the living system. 
I wish you a lot of fun for the continuation of this course. Goodbye, and thanks for your attention.